We're going to okay. start taking questions in a moment. So if you want to start jotting down your questions, and we're going to have two people, I think Katie and Jennifer will probably go around and just make sure, you know, don't walk in front of cameras. Can um, I tell my favorite story uh, for reporters absolutely, lately? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It's the time of the Johnstown flood in Pennsylvania around 1920. And a, an editor sent a cub reporter to cover the flood. He had never covered a big story before. And he sent a telegram to the, his office for a start of, the, of his story, which said, God sat on the banks of the Johnstown River today and cried. And the editor looked at it and he said, he fired another telegram back. He said, forget the flood, interview God. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to have that interview. That would be an awesome one. <laughs> So, retirement. I mean, do you see retirement in your future? What? <laughs> At this stage, hell no. <laughs> do they have mandatory retirement? I want to die with my boots on, but you never know from day to day. I've never had a sense of security, not in the newspaper business. And as you know, newspapers are dying like flies now. It's uh, a lost art. And I think it's terrible because the newspaper engulfs you. You read much more than you would ordinarily if you went to a computer. I, I think it's going to be a great loss for the country. I think democracy will suffer without, without newspapers. So I, I can't imagine having a cup of coffee in the morning and not having a newspaper in my hand. It's something that you read much more and uh, learn much more, I think. You can get much more depth than your little telephone. Um, so I, nobody quite knows what the answer is, the loss of revenue and so forth. But we do know that uh, everybody, every, it's a dying art. Do you think we're losing reporters? I mean, it's, it, the industry has changed so much where anybody can be a reporter. We're being reporters right now. Um, Everybody with a laptop thinks they're a journalist. <laughs> I do. <laughs> but I wouldn't dare to compare myself to, to what you do and how important that is and, and the voice and how you represent no, that. No, anybody can do it. When I was writing for wire services, as I said, it was just a fax, ma'am. But when I started then working for Hearst Newspapers, writing a column, um, the editor looked at it and said, Where's the edge? I said, the what? Your opinion. What? My opinion? I bought, had an opinion on everything since the day I was born, but I never put it in the copy because that was verboten. So now I wake up in the morning and I say, who do I hate today? <laughs> <laughs> Simply because you can't like things as a column. Once in a while you can be nice. But otherwise, you're supposed to skewer everybody. <laughs> That's an interesting job to start your day. Okay, ooh, okay, we got a great, great question that just came in. Who was your favorite president and why? John F. Kennedy, because I thought he was the most inspired. He created the Peace Corps. He had been to war. He went to the brink in the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, because he had learned lessons from the Bay of Pigs. Uh, he signed the first nuclear test ban treaty, and he said America, America would never go to war for no reason. So I think that the biggest thing was his, he said during the first year uh, that we, you know, we were going to explore the universe, and he, he invited a, the first class of past astronauts to come to the White House with his wives for an informal dinner. And during the mix and mingle, he said to them, do you think, do you think we could land on the moon? And they said, sure, absolutely. You never say no to a president. <laughs> when they left, they said, is this guy nuts? <laughs> is he crazy? Go land on the moon. But then he, we did it. He didn't live to see it, but we did it. He set goals. He used to tell young people, there's a universe out there we have to explore. He also told them to go into public service, that it could be the crown of their careers, to give something back to the country. That is, that is awesome. 
So here's a great question. If you had to do it all over again, what would you create differently, if anything? What would you do differently or create differently in your life, if you could go back? You always Monday morning quarterback a story, stories. So why didn't I ask this? Why didn't I write this? And so forth. There is nothing. I mean, your self-criticism is the most important thing. I think you always regret, why didn't I ask the president that? I had one shot in the barrel, and I should have nailed him. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think so. The that, FBI those is here. I'm just warning you. <laughs> said, why didn't you stand up and say, look, why? <laughs> my, why is my favorite question. <laughs> Are you a fan of women's sports or sports in general? No, but I really admire the women who are. And I, I, great sports women because I think they're, they've added a lot to our country. But I, I'm not a follower. You know, it's really interesting to see how women, you know, I'm really excited to begin to see. I think, I don't know if Rich Daniels here. We have somebody from the D.C. Divas, which is uh, the Washington, D.C. women's football team. Mm -hmm. And um, there's the Washington Mystics. And we do support them because we think it's important that women, I think sports are another great avenue for women to learn skill sets and, and life. I think that that's I a really important thing to do. I think it's funny in Title IX that they don't think the women's sports should have equality. And that is so stupid. See, it's I mean, the equality thing for you. They should have the right to... Absolutely. Although I don't want to play on a football team. Um, <laughs> who was the first lady you most admired, and what, um, and what was her community-giving focus? So, so what was her particular mm -hmm. focus on her, her while she was serving as first lady? Well, I, this is the first Pollyanna answer I'll give you, is I admired all of them, because each one... Once they realized the power they had and the, the ability to do good, they rose to the occasion. It's amazing. They really did. You know, some took longer to say, where, to understand where they were. They had ten mops, ten maids doing all the things that they, so they could really make a contribution. And also, after Eleanor Roosevelt, every first lady wanted to make her mark in some way to have a project. So I... I I admired them all, really, and uh, as I say, some were slow starters. Nancy Reagan carried the burden of being just uh, a Rodeo Drive uh, matron and uh, um, loved beautiful Fashion. clothes yeah. and uh, expensive china and so forth. But once they got rid of that, I mean, that image, and they knew they had to correct it, then she became a big very crusader against drugs among youth. And so, uh, I liked Betty Ford so much because she wasn't afraid to say she had been divorced, had seen a psychiatrist, and so forth. Uh, she was very strong for ERA, and uh, she was basically the essence of what do you say after you say you're sorry. I mean, you tell the truth, and she understood that women, uh, that everybody would accept that. She, uh, was, she was a door saw, opener for candor, I think, for women. And Lady Bird Johnson beautified the whole country. I mean, she really set a great uh, model for, so all of them. Jackie transformed the White House from its, to its colonial elegance and so forth. So all of them really understood that they were there to do something, especially after Mr. Roosevelt, who went to battlefields and, and helped the poor and the sick and so forth, who understood the power that she had. That's a, I think that that was really remarkable. I'm sure people will be happy here. There are people in the White House that you don't, that you think are great. So, who was, who was no. the, <laughs> I didn't say that right, but, but you know what I meant. Okay, so, and on that same vein, who was the most interesting woman that you've ever had a chance to interview? I mean, outside who wasn't a first lady, but who was some of the most fascinating or interesting women you've, you've had the chance to, to interview and talk to? Besides me. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to say, you know. I think some of my personal friends were great. I was thinking of a woman I had who was a great friend. Uh, she was a doctor, and she had polio since the age of nine and had braces on her legs, and she became uh, a public... Uh, she went to... Uh, she was going to the University of Michigan uh, even though she had come from upstate New York, uh, very near Jamestown, a little town, 
Kreuzberg, and uh, somehow she was able to work her way with all her afflictions. And when she got to, uh, her family was very, very poor, and she was offered a job to work in a, with a family and try to work her way through college. And she was torn because her family wanted her to come home and said she thought she could help them more at home. And then she saw this big billboard when she was going to Ann Arbor and going to University of Michigan to med school. And she saw this bill, and when she was in a real dilemma, and it said, Pillsbury Best. And that was a sign for her to to uh, go go to uh, to work for this family because the family's name was Pillsbury. Okay. <laughs> so they, so, so those are the those are the women. And then during World War II, she was in public health, and she was also with the Children's Bureau. So I think we've been lucky to meet a lot of people who were greatly contrib contributing to our society. I lived in an apartment, uh, fourth floor walk up, and uh, one of the neighbors was a wonderful woman from Vienna, a doctor and uh, a cellist, and she had fled from Hitler. And so, so all of these things, we are so lucky, all of our contacts. Everybody, I think, in their own life, and especially Washington, where you meet so many interesting people. It's so true. It is absolutely so true. 